very much, Ben. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to talk tonight. Um, and it's really nice to see so many people here. Thank you all for coming. Um, can I just have a quick show of hands how many people are um, have a background in psychology? Okay. And how many people are here because they have a specific interest in women's studies or gender issues? Okay, so I need to apologise to all of these people. Um, so for the psychologists that are here tonight, I'm going to be talking about stereotyping at quite a low level, quite a basic level, because what I'm going to try to do is use gender stereotyping as a way, as a sort of lens through which we can study how stereotypes are formed and how they impact on cognition and behaviour. So rather than focusing on gender as an issue, I want to focus on gender as a way of understanding stereotyping. So I hope that doesn't fit perfectly. Um, <coughs> I do have a tendency to perhaps go off a little bit on my little gender stereotyping soapbox. If I start doing that, please shake your head at me and remind me to get back to the evidence. So what I want to do really is focus on the scientific evidence, on the research that helps us to understand where stereotypes come from, how they impact on cognition and behaviour, um, because by understanding these processes we can make informed decisions about the extent to which we want to include them in our society. So, I'm not going to try and tell you whether gender stereotypes should be part of your society or not. That's not my role. My role is to give you some understanding of the evidence and then society can decide how much it's willing to endorse these sorts of stereotypes. Um, so my plan generally is to talk for maybe about half an hour um, and then we'll have lots of, times for, lots of time for questions if people are interested. Um, and then we're going to finish with a little talk from Lindsay Gardner, who's a local artist and children's author, um, who has an interest in characters who are, uh, <coughs> have something to say about gender stereotypes. So we thought that would be quite a nice way to round off the evening. Now, I said say I wasn't going to get on my soapbox, but I do want to give you a bit of information about my personal interest in gender stereotyping, because I do think it's something that's got a personal relevance to most of us. So I grew up in a, a family of three girls, but I'm the tomboy in my household, so I was always one that was watching the football with my dad, or, or doing plumbing, or hanging wallpaper, um, and at school I was always interested in the subjects like maths and physics that I knew at the time weren't typical of my gender, and in fact when I came to university I went on to study engineering, which is just about the most male-dominated subject you can do at university. So I was very aware of what gender stereotypes were, and I was aware that I didn't fit the typical mould of what girls were supposed to be. But actually, it never seemed like a negative thing. It was quite positive to be doing something that wasn't perhaps expected of me. However, when I got older and had a family of my own, uh, I had a daughter, then it hit me just how strong gender stereotypes were and just how uncomfortable it made me that gender stereotypes were still such a big part of our society. So. When I, I had two sons first and then I had a daughter. So I thought my sons grew up in quite a gender neutral household. Uh, they did have lots of toys that were like dinosaurs and toy cars and things like that, but they also had a tea set and I had a little toy kitchen and we had um, a buggy. And my son used to push the buggy around like it was a racing car. However, he had a buggy <laughs> with a, a doll in it. Um, so I thought that the house was fairly gender neutral. But when my daughter arrived, <laughs> Then everything hit me, <laughs> because it turned out that nobody thought that my house was suitable for a girl, that everything that I thought was okay, like having white cot sheets, turned out not to be at all appropriate if you have a girl in the house, because you have to have pink cot sheets, and it's not okay to have a pram or a bouncy chair or even cutlery that's not pink. So every time there's a Christmas or a birthday or a christening or anything, people buy you all this pink stuff. So my house became completely flooded with pink. And it made me very aware of the different environments that we then create for boys and girls. It's a really interesting thing. Um, and it seems to be particularly relevant for girls, that they have to be made to be different to what was okay for the boys. It's really quite strange. So this is kind of my personal experience, but there's also lots of evidence supporting this. So there's quite a nice study done where um, <coughs> the uh, researchers asked people to hold a young baby. Now, young babies, you can't tell the sex of them just by looking at their face. Um, so the participants were given the baby and told it was either called Nathan or called Sarah. Um, and the researchers just monitored how the participants interacted with this baby. If it was a baby, if they thought it was a baby girl, they did, they commented on the way the baby looked. So they'd say things like, oh, aren't you pretty? And look at your big eyes. And you're just going to be lovely when you grow up. 
Whereas if it was a boy, they would comment on the strings, aren't you a big strong boy? All that sort of thing. It's much more physical characteristics that are not to do with personal attractiveness. Um, and also they would hold a baby girl, what they thought was a baby girl, close to the body, whereas a baby boy they would hold further away. So this kind of socialisation of treating boys and girls very differently starts very early. I think the worst example that happened to me, and <coughs> anyone who knows me will already know this story because it horrified me so much, was when my daughter came home from school in primary one and said, Mommy, I'm glad I'm pretty and not smart. <laughs> <laughs> How does she got this message? Because I didn't think it was coming from her house. Surely that's not what school is about teaching girls. Um, but once she said that, I started to tune in to the kind of messages that she was getting from the people who interact with her. So every time an adult comes into our house, they'll say to my daughter, how pretty you look today. Look at your lovely top. Isn't your hair nice? To my sons, they would never say that. They would never say, oh, look at your big eyes. Never. They'd say, what have you been doing today? Have you been outside? They comment on what the boy is doing, they'll comment on what the girl looks like. Um, <laughs> so what I'm interested in is trying to find ways of measuring the extent to which we treat boys and girls in different, as different, and then exploring some of the consequences of that to see if it has a measurable impact on their cognition and behaviour. <laughs>